So one of the studies that Professor Kruger and Forster from their unit have also published is related to physical inactivity, and obviously that's really important in determining whether it's linked to obesity. And so I looked through this paper and, and came to some interesting findings. Firstly, they noticed that the high prevalence of overweight and obesity were found in the total population, despite a relatively low fat intake, so that the energy intake in this population was only 26% from fat. And so they drew the conclusion that obesity can occur even with relatively low fat intakes. And so that's an obviously, obviously a conclusion and which would fit with the model that perhaps it wasn't the fat that was driving the obesity, something else. And so they concluded it's questionable whether dietary fat intake, independent of energy intake, is an important determinant of obesity in the South African population. So that's still compatible with the, the carbohydrates driving obesity, but we need also to consider the role of physical inactivity, at least in the energy in, energy output model. So they concluded that South Africa represents an outlier with a higher prevalence of overweight but a lower percentage of energy from fat. And the obvious conclusion from that then is, shouldn't the authors consider an alternate hypothesis? That actually it's the high carbohydrate diet of these rural South Africans that is causing their high rates of obesity. And so that I think becomes your responsibility when you find something that doesn't make sense according to your model because their model might be that it's fat which makes people fat, and then you find that people eating little fat become fat, then you have to consider the alternate hypothesis. And as a scientist, your responsibility is to do a, an examination and a study to try to disprove that alternate hypothesis. And I just want to go back again to Professor Foster's comments and her concerns with the, the low carbohydrate diet as being dangerous. She said, it's in for, unfortunately irresponsible that low carbohydrate diets are promoted aggressively in South Africa, especially against the background of our high burden of disease, including chronic disease and conditions related to underdevelopment. And my argument would be, well, the population that is unhealthy is eating a high carbohydrate diet. And one needs to be able to confirm that the high carbohydrate diet is not the cause of the problem before one can simply accuse others of being irresponsible promoting a low carbohydrate diet because they see that the low carbohydrate diet might be the solution to the problem. So the point is what if these diseases and underdevelopment are a direct consequence of the current dietary advice, especially in those with insulin resistance. So that is the, the postulate that, in my opinion, we need to be evaluating in South Africa. And we're going to shortly move to other populations in South Africa showing that insulin resistance is, is a high prevalence, as is the incidence of atherogenic dyslipidemia. And so, so part of the evidence comes from this study from this group at the Vaal University of Technology, Funderbale Park. And these two authors published this paper, I think it was <coughs> two, three years ago. And that was in South Africa, Professor. This is a South African population, and the title is Prevalence of and Contributing Factors to Dyslipidemia in Low-Income Women Aged 18 to 90 Years in the Peri-Urban Vaal Region. And the authors are Aldevag, Teron, and Egal. And notice the words dyslipidemia, and this is a low-income population, and it's, it's a rural community. And these were the essential finding that a large percentage of the women, aged between 80 and 90, had dyslipidemia. The majority of women in the non-dyslipidemic group were overweight. Now recall that Professor Forster's hypothesis was that the people living in the rural communities are healthier than the people living in the cities. And, and that may be so, but that doesn't make this population particularly healthy if they are 52% overweight. And 86% were, were obese. The total fat intake was only 20% of total energy intake in both groups. So here we have a population that is following the dietary guidelines in terms of fat, total carbohydrate, total fat consumption, but they're clearly not looking too healthy. And their conclusion then was dyslipidemia was prevalent, high triglyceride and low HDL 
cholesterol levels were the most frequent abnormalities. Now, from what we've spent the whole morning doing, when you see high triglycerides and low HDL, you make one diagnosis, insulin resistance. That's it. And so BMI, age and education were the main predictors of dyslipidemia. In fact, probably insulin resistance should have been included. And it's really interesting because I wrote to these authors and I said, but your study proves that insulin resistance is prevalent. And, and they couldn't get their minds around that one at all, and they didn't uh, support that hypothesis. But, but to me, it's very clear that this population is eating a very high carbohydrate diet, low fat diet, they're insulin resistant, and they're showing the dyslipidemia. So the conclusion, this dyslipidemia is caused, as I've shown, by a high carbohydrate diet in those who are insulin resistant who suffer from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's the hypothesis that they are. We've got evidence they're insulin resistance. I don't have any evidence they've got NAFLD, but that one, that's what you would do next in this population if you wanted to, to advance this research. Now, now Professor, one uh, statistic that probably stands out uh, in this, uh, on page 465, is that 86.2% of women in the dyslipidemic group were obese. What would be the normal uh, rate of obesity in South Africa? I think amongst women it might be, in this type of population, it could well be 50%. I, again, I speak under correction, but that's sort of the figure that I would expect. And 86.2%? Would yeah, you comment on that? that? That's very high. That's a very high incidence. Um, I think the countries with the highest obesity rates in the world, that they'd be struggling to get 86% of their women obese. So my conclusion is that rural women eating a healthy, low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet had high rates of obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, and that dyslipidemia is diagnostic of insulin resistance. And so the population is insulin resistance, res insulin resistant, and I believe that that proves that their carbohydrate diet is contraindicated. And this is a fundamental problem we have in South Africa, that if these populations are insulin resistant and we're encouraging them to eat high-carbohydrate diets, we are damaging their health in the long term. Professor, would you explain why uh, you would say that the carbohydrate diet, the high carbohydrate diet in these circumstances is contraindicated? It's contraindicated for a number of reasons. Firstly, it will increase the insulin resistance so that this is a progressive condition. The reason why obesity is an is a, is a age-dependent condition is because insulin resistance gets worse with age. So the more carbohydrates you eat from a young age, the quicker you develop more insulin resistance. So by and large, people who develop obesity in middle life are born insulin resistant. And then they're exposed to high carbohydrate diets and they get progressively more insulin resistant and the obesity develops. So that's the first problem. If you want to induce insulin resistance and make it worse, you must feed people the high carbohydrate diets. And secondly, for all the reasons I've described, that the atherogenic dyslipidemia is determined by the high carbohydrate diet. So you've got a population that's getting more and more insulin resistant, you're feeding them more and more carbohydrates, the atherogenic dyslipidemia is going to get worse. And remember, they didn't look for small dense LDL particles, which they should have done. And they didn't measure insulin and they didn't measure glucose. And they did measure blood pressure, but didn't not report it here. But we would have seen that all those variables were increased in this population. So this is a population sitting on a time bomb. They are going to become either diabetic or develop coronary heart disease in the long term. They have to. That's the outcome. If you feed insulin resistant people carbohydrates, they will develop type 2 diabetes in the long term. So now we move to Cape Town and Belleville. And to many people, Belleville could be the focus for the insulin resistance problem in Southern Africa and certainly a diabetes problem because diabetes is just out of control in the Western Cape and it's particularly amongst the colored community, I, I, I use that word differentially, the so-called colored community and we have to understand that they seem to be uniquely predisposed to develop type 2 diabetes and then the question is well why and I would argue that it's because they're exposed to high carbohydrate diets from a young age and lots of sugar as well. So here's a paper published by this group uh, from the University of Stellenbosch who have done remarkably good work in this field. 
And they, they, their title is High Prevalence of Diabetes and Metabolic Syndrome in a South African Colored Population in Belleville. And so they notice that the prevalence of diabetes has increased hugely, and perhaps it would be better to have an actual number, but anyway, hugely means more than to be expected. In the colored community, in the high prevalence of undiagnosed diabetes. And remember, this is using the criteria that we currently use. It's not even using the criteria that we need to, which is insulin responses. Portends that cardiovascular disease might grow to epidemic proportions in the near future in South Africa. So it's interesting that they link diabetes to heart disease, but what should they be linking diabetes to? Arterial, disseminated arterial disease, because that is what costs this nation. Because it's losing limbs, it's losing eyesight, it's going on to renal dialysis. Uh, it's losing legs and needing people to look after you. That's what costs people. It's not heart disease. Heart disease is nowhere near as expensive as disseminated arterial disease. So they could make their argument even stronger if they said the undiagnosed diabetes portends that arterial disease will grow to epidemic proportions. And I think that's an important point. So here in Cape, in the Western Cape, we have diabetes growing at an inordinate rate. Here they say, in this study, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes was 28%. And one has to understand that diabetes is a very expensive disease. 88% of females with type 2 diabetes were obese by waist measurement, whereas 42% of males were obese, and 55% were undiagnosed. So that is the measure of the tsunami of diabetes that is just sitting in this town that is going to wipe out medical services within the next 5 or 10 years.